All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Built by Bailey's podcast. Joining me, as always, is my lovely co-host and cousin, Evan Bailey. Good morning, sir. How are you? Top of the morning to you, gentlemen. Doing good. <clears throat> Looking good, sir. You look, always. You look <laughs> wide awake and ready to go. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, I'm trying to lie for you, man. Come on, no, play thanks, with brother. it. Play with it. That's why I love you. <laughs> Well, we're really excited for our next guest. Uh, obviously, you guys know the drill before we get started. We want to do a shout out to our wonderful sponsors, Confluence SBC. ConfluenceSBC.com is a co-working space in Lafayette, Colorado. Uh, they incorporate all of Boulder County. Tom Hardy and the crew over there do a wonderful job. Gorgeous building in the heart of Old Town Lafayette. Uh, they are still open for some memberships desk. They have those by the month and they, I believe, still have uh, full-term office leases available. Look them up at confluencesbc.com if you're looking to get office space, even temporary office space. Wonderful community over there. We love those guys a lot and want to say thanks. Also, love to say thanks, as always, to Brian Scott of 69 Designs. They are the guys that do all of our logo stuff, um, they do a lot of logo stuff for a lot of big names, waste management to Copper Mountain. Uh, he is a wonderful graphic artist. Um, you want some stickers? He throws those all over the place. Um, hit him up. Brian Scott is uh, local to the Denver area and also an awesome mountain biker. And he keeps posting pictures I get jealous of. So. And he's Uncle B. And he's Uncle B. That's right. We That's love right. Brian. That's right. <clears throat> all right. Without further ado... I'm going to actually let Evan introduce our next guest because um, we are really excited to be hopefully working with him soon as well. So welcome That's right. To the show. We have Troy. So I met Troy through a endeavor that Shane and I are moving forward with, with uh, building a container home. Uh, and he has partnered with Colorado Container Homes. Colorado Container Homes? That, is that? Yeah, Colorado. COC. COC. That's yeah. COC. Yeah. Troy is a lender um, who specializes. We'll have him tell us a little bit about what he does, but he specializes uh, well in container financing, ADU financing, and uh, he probably does a lot more than that, but that's how we know him. Um, and in this conversation him and I have been having, it came up that we had a podcast and the stars lined up, and here he is there in he is. the flesh to talk about what he does, and we can also discuss uh, our project a little bit, and we can get to know him a little bit. So, Troy, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me on. I uh, was really excited when you talked about the podcast. I'm like, ha, love doing these. Yeah. So, um, I, uh, you know, I I work for a bank. Um, my, I've got a couple of different marketing branches. I have finance my ADU um, and uh, finance my container home. Um, I've got the web pages set up and uh, that way it's just easier for people to find. And what I found is, you know, I've been doing lending because I, like you mentioned, I can do any type of loan that there is out there. Um, but in this market and in the US, I found that uh, there really was a need for construction and renovation. Um, let's face it, the, the housing market is, uh, the inventory is just so low, um, not a lot of choices. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> nope. So, you know, both as a consumer and as a loan officer, I'm like, hey, what, what makes sense? Uh, where is the market going to? And uh, then I was introduced to uh, the container homes, uh, just kind of out of a fluke, um, meeting with different companies. And uh, I get excited about it because I think one, that they're fun. Um, they're, uh, you know, low carbon footprint, they uh, uh, they tend to be they're very trendy. They can mm -hmm. go up very very quickly, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously it's the the cost is uh, significantly less than let's say a, a million dollar home build. Mm -hmm. and, right. uh, and so that's yep. what kind of got me interested in that. Um, I'm very fortunate that my bank um, yeah. allows me to do these loans for container homes because, uh, like we were talking, we've talked about before, not a lot of banks want to touch these. No. <laughs> no. No, for, for all the wrong should. reasons, too. <clears throat> for all the wrong reasons. And you literally, yeah. and it, it's kind of funny, and we'll talk more about this, but what I have found is a lot of times with certain people, um, whether it be at the city level, the bank level, uh, appraisers, their eyes tend to kind of roll back. <laughs> yeah. If you say yep. container homes, they're like, oh, yep. gosh. Mm -hmm. and, and really, that is just, uh, that's kind of old school thinking. Uh, it's for people that people who like love this stick build, 
um, who just don't really kind of think of this as a solution. Um, mm-hmm. But what I found is that once you talk to them, they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Well, why wouldn't we think of this way? Yeah. Um, yeah. Shane who- and I used to always say, you know, when you use the word container, mm-hmm. they're thinking steel box, you're going to cook people in there like an oven. Yeah, and really, exactly. all it is, is just a building block. It's steel construction. Right. And if you think of it that way, you know, it's, yeah, it kind of changes the perspective on it a little bit. Absolutely. And I, and I coach my customers when they're talking to other people <clears throat> outside our circle, don't mm-hmm. use container, uh, use the word modular. Because basically, right. that's all yep, we're that's, talking about. That's all it is. Modular homes just happen to be made out of container. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Um, the one folks that uh, that I always get a kick out of is when you talk to engineers, though, their eyes light up They're like, you know, those are really, really strong. You know, they yeah. stack those things 10, 10 high when on the <clears throat> ships, when they bring them over, they can they can outlast hurricanes. It's kind of it's neat to watch them uh, get excited and they, they, they start tinkering around with ideas and how the plans that they want to uh, put together for their next house. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's exactly what it is. And I mean, Evan and I have talked about that even very recently about the 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 way to explain it, especially to a bank, right? Um, and that's 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 the hardest part is to say we're doing steel construction. You guys finance commercial and you know commercial construction all the time. So, you know, why why can't you get your head wrapped around using these, which are usually recycled, at least for a while, recycled containers? Why can't you get your head wrapped around it? Um, and that's the hardest part. And it's good that you're coaching them on how to go speak to uh, banks because the most important part about getting these kind of this, this type of construction moving forward is being able to get it in kind of the wheelhouse of, of more banks and more lenders and understanding that this is a better way to build in a lot of ways and a lot of applications. So, um, uh-oh, did we lose them? Maybe. We might have been gone. We'll get Troy back in a minute, but yeah, we'll get Troy back in a minute. You know, it's interesting, Shane, that he, um, he, as a lender, it's interesting to hear him talk about the same things we find uh, Mm -hmm. challenging as the consumer. Right. You know, and it's encouraging to think that banks are evolving and he brought up like the current market conditions and I just, like you look at Denver right now and for to buy a three bedroom, two bath house in Denver, I mean, you're going to need 600 grand and you might have to renovate that thing. Um, right. Or exactly. a renovated home is 700, 800, 900 to a million. And, but there are still buildable lots. There are things to do um, in that regard. I think we got them back. And um, it's just so challenging anymore. And I think that's what Troy was kind of alluding to was that mm-hmm. you can you can look at construction, but construction and lending, um, especially those two together, kind of need to go through their own evolution um, and make and adapt itself to low inventory, to new building types, to, uh, to modular or different alternative construction types. And I wouldn't even necessarily say shipping container homes is necessarily a an alternative building in the, or a, 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 a building process. Right. It seems like it, but as you and I have discussed, you're still framing walls, you're insulating, mm-hmm. you're doing all these things, putting floors, flooring in and windows. And, you know, instead of, you know, putting up sheathing or something, it's just you got a metal wall there before you start. Right. And, and I think that's the other part of creating a new narrative not only just around container construction, but also just alternative construction. Mm-hmm. Construction is construction. Wood is wood. Metal is metal. Screws are screws. And I think the faster that lenders become more comfortable with anything other than stick build, the traditional stick build, it would be huge for people, whether it's low-income housing, whether it's low-impact building, whether it's opening up different types of property that can be built on. I just think it is so critical for banks to continue to evolve to not only make room for you know, a more profitable business model or to pick up more clients, but I think it's mm-hmm. also really important um, because I think it opens up new opportunities for home ownership. And you know, we exactly. don't have to drop the standards for safety and all of these things. We just need to be more... 
cognizant of different building processes that create more opportunity, not only for the lender, but for the consumer, for the neighborhoods, for communities. And um, I just think we're at that precipice where we're starting to see this bend a little bit. And I think people like Troy saying, I think it's safe. You know, I think it's fine. Well, and you've got it, the IRC all- that's recognized it. 2018, 2021 books are recognizing and ha- they have sections, they have, they have all their assemblies in there on the, in the code book to recognize this type of construction. So people like me are in there writing ways to make this more efficient. And, and it's a mainstream way of thinking about it on our end. And Troy hit it on the head. Banks have an old school way of thinking. This industry in itself is an old school way of thinking. Um, Troy, when you went to your bank and you talked about this, <laughs> Tell us how that went. Tell yeah. us kind of, yeah, go through that story walk, a little bit. Walk I can us through that imagine story. you walking into like a big <laughs> bank boardroom and saying, guys, I have this idea. <laughs> you know, <laughs> tell us how that went. Uh-oh. Oh, volume. We've lost the- uh, Missing audio on him. Yeah. We'll give Troy a second here. Uh, but you were talking about too, Evan. You were talking about. Okay. I mean, I'm, oh, there he is. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah you're back. back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Troy. All, right. All right. Give us your story. Sorry. All right. Yeah. So, you know, um, it was kind of a, uh, an interesting story. And, uh, you know, I'm fortunate. Enough, we, I work for a small bank called North Point Bank, and it's, um, it's a small community lender. So they're willing to kind of take a look at new ideas and kind of new thoughts. It's not like one of these big banks that just are, are very staunch and um, very narrow-minded. So the, the kind of the thought was it kind of built around, hey, we've, we've been doing modular home loans for quite some time. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, they kind of came up with a couple of things. One, and you had mentioned before, you know, obviously everything has to meet building code, building and right. safety code. That's the snow weight on the roof, uh, the egressed windows, um, the R value. And so that was probably the big hurdle. It's like, oh, well, these all meet that. They have to meet that or we can't get a, the CO or certificate of occupancy for this. Right. Um, the one piece that we have in place, it's uh, one of our bank overlays, is the size, is that we do require that they have to be 600 square foot. Okay. Um, be- because what happens a lot of times, um, you know, people will, will want to build just one, and, you know, a typical um, uh, container is going to be eight by 40. So that's mm-hmm. 320 square foot. Now, right. For a main structure, that would never work. Um, right. Now, is know, that Troy? Is that to avoid t- the 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 label home. of tiny home? Um, I, I think is that kind of like the threshold? Marketability. Um, you know, you, you think about like resale value. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and like any bank, we want it. We have to be able to resell these loans as well. And it could, um, you know, like I said, probably the biggest thing is being able to resell. And that way it has value. Um, y- you know, one of the things that, um, that does, uh, that, may, uh, that was really a challenge is finding the comparables. Mm-hmm. And so that brings a whole other, um, a whole other, uh, you know, challenge in there. And that's, uh, looking for a house because m- most cases when we're building these container homes or doing loans, there's no other container homes in the area. Right. Um, right. In a perfect world that we choose from. So what we do is we have to coach up the appraiser and say, hey, this is just, it's a modular home. Um, it's, you know, 640 <laughs> square foot. Mm-hmm. It's got two bedrooms, one bath. Let's go find a cabin that is very, mm-hmm. very similar to that. Right. And yep. as long as they kind of focus on the specs of the house, then we're able to kind of get through that appraisal hurdle. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So I'm, I'm in finance uh, as my job job and um, I, and it's in auto finance. And one of the things that I try to explain to people about financing a car, right. And how that works um, is that the bank is really building an entire model of, you know, and this sounds like a dumb moment, but I think people kind of lose track of it because they just think about what they want. I just give me the money because I want it. Right. Mm-hmm. The bank is lending money, assuming you'll never make a payment on it or that you're going to default yep. on the loan. And that that property goes back to them that they now have to figure out what to do with. And mm-hmm. the bankers, you know, the bankers, right? They don't live in these properties. They got to market it. They got to put it back for sale, right? So I think that's one of the first steps in getting um, getting this kind of 
to open up a little bit is for banks to get more comfortable. And, and of course, the more inventory there is, uh, that helps. So the more common this type of construction uh, happens helps because now all of a sudden you can go back and look historically how these things have happened, right? So if you're the first container house and you default on your loan, it goes back to the bank and they're like, okay, what do we do with this house? And if it doesn't sell or nobody will buy it, then it kind of proves the concerns or the fears of the bank. But if you have a thousand of these that have gone back to the bank or have resold or whatever, then it starts to kind of lessen the concern that they mm -hmm. do this. And I think the other interesting point, Troy, is there's still this, like, we got to look at a comparable container home, you know, to something else. And maybe size, square foot, bed, bath, location, you know, that kind of thing is still important to anything. But Shane and I have discussed this, and I'd love to have your thoughts on it. It's still weird to think, well, we have to find another container home <laughs> potentially to, um, and I'm not saying you said this, by the way, yeah. but another container home to find a comparable. And it's like, well, this one's built out of brick and this right. one has siding. Do we need to find another brick house, you mm -hmm. know, to compare it to? Which means to me that we just still have a ways to go to say that there's different construction types and finishes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, whether this one's started with steel and this one started with brick or cinder block or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, um, they are still just houses and there's different ways to build houses. The difference is all those other types of houses are understood as, well, there's just different kinds of houses and yep. it is a house, you know, so we don't care if it's brick or if it's siding or if it's stone or concrete or but those are all okay. So a house is a house, except for a container house. Yep. You know, now, and I, and because Shane and I have, you know, prior to meeting you and a couple of years ago, started looking at banks for financing. And, you know, that was the first thing they would say, well, there's just no container homes for comparables. And that was always what mm -hmm. I would have to explain to them and say, well, mm -hmm. It's going to be wood cladded. It's going to have drywall on the inside. I mean, what, what do you? Uh, what, what does the fact that it starts with a container have to do with anything? And I knew their answer, but I wanted to try to reset their mind a little yep. bit to kind of be like, you know what? Actually, technically, you're right. It's like, no, not technically. It, it is right. <laughs> it is right. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's brick. That one's siding. That one's concrete. That one's stone. That one's thin. You know, so. Um, how did you deal with that with your bank? So you're talking about more looking at, cause you're still kind of talking about the 600 square foot. Yeah. Um, and, and I can have a little more uh, color on, um, yeah. commentary <clears throat> on, on the 600 square foot. Cause traditionally what happened, I think when container homes, especially when they're new to an area or it's a new concept, um, people like try to sell finance these, they go out and they say, Hey, oh, go buy right. me a, a $5,000 uh, container, drop it. And you know, on the weekends, I'm going to lay the, put the floor in with the wiring, mm. And so they're not the big mass projects of a, of a home. Right. And, um, and I think that probably maybe where the ball got going. Now, what, interesting enough, when you do that way, that's actually more technically a, a stick build. So mm -hmm. you drop it on the site. It's unfinished. You know, on the site, you're cutting the windows <laughs> in, you're putting the floor in, you're connecting yep. all the utilities with yep. the foundation. So that's technically more of a stick build. Mm -hmm. uh, the easier way to do it um, is when it's more like the modular build. Um, and, and this is really big, let's say in Washington, where, hey, they have a factory, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, right. and the Colorado Container Homes is kind of is very, very similar to that, where they're mm -hmm. doing 80, 90% of the work in the factory. So right. It's climate controlled. They can do it year round. Um, you know, they, they're really specialized in that uh, very, very low waste. And that way you, we can actually send the inspector, as far as the building inspection goes, in the factory. Yep. yep. Um, and what's nice about that is once you get two or three of those under your belt, uh, the inspector's a whole lot easier to work with. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Versus, exactly. You know, yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, yeah. you're uh, because that, it's that inspector in that town or that county mm -hmm. that's yep. going to be looking at that. Versus if you take it and you move it down to you know four or five hundred miles down south or, or whatever the case would be, mm -hmm. uh, you don't know that particular local inspector may or may not be familiar with the whole process, and you might have to. It, it, it's a, it's about coaching them up, of educating them, and yep. um, right. And just asking, you know, humbly the right questions. <laughs> right. Now, no, I've, it's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. I've heard that this is a uh, shipping container homes is now um, an approved form of construction. 
I think mm-hmm. like Fannie Mae. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay. They well. Yeah. And so the big difference is, is that, so I do, uh, I focus on two types of loans and I focus on uh, a construction loan and a renovation loan. Yeah. Okay. The, the renovation loan, those are, they start out being Freddie and Fannie loans. I do a lot of Fannie, the homestyle renovation, but because this is a ground up build, it's a construction loan. Mm-hmm. And our construction loan, it starts out as a portfolio loan with my bank, right? Okay. Meaning we, we may or may not, um, we're, we're going to sell it, <laughs> um, right. but it's not, it, it's not automatically checkmarked like, oh, boom, this is going to go fanny right away. Mm-hmm. Um, it can, um, but it more likely than not, then it's going to go to um, uh, our regular investors. Um, but then what happens, and we, we can talk more about structure of the loan, um, mm-hmm. but it starts out as a construction loan, and then it actually converts to the permanent loan. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, just uh, without getting a whole lot of details, although we can we can mm-hmm. dive deep if we want. During mm-hmm. the construction, you're paying interest only. Right. On the, okay. We're not escrowing anything. We're paying the builder off of draws, and like mm-hmm. I said, and the payment builds as the the builder does draws against uh, the escrow uh, amount that we've uh, we've set aside for the construction project. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is which is pretty standard. Yep. Construction yep. type, you know, layout for a loan. I mean, that's not any different than most construction exactly. loans are laid out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then what happens at the end when we get the CO or the certificate of occupancy, then we can do a couple of things. One, we can just let it ride and just flip it right over to um, our, our permanent financing loan. And mm-hmm. then that goes the path. But we can also we can also look at modifying it at that time. Then when we do the modification, we could be looking at turning into a Fannie or a Freddie type of loan. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So you buy... If you're, so let's, we'll, we'll do a uh, simple example here. So you are Evan Bailey and Mm -hmm. you're looking at a lot, what's called a hundred thousand dollars. So you will do a loan on the land, Mm -hmm. right? And then once you have approved construction plans, I'm going to, I'm dumbing this way down. um, At that point you say, Hey man, I'll give you the loan for your construction. Let's call it $200,000. And you now have a construction loan because you're going to wrap the land in that. Is that the right wording? Yeah, that correct. Yeah. Okay. And then you're going to draw the money. So you're going to say, let's say like Colorado Container Homes needs 50% of that money up front to get started. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to lend $100,000. So now you are paying interest only on a $100,000 lot and a $100,000 construction loan at the beginning. Yeah. You're paying 50% on the draw. And then Colorado Container Homes requires, I think, 40% for the next when they get to a certain point. You mm-hmm. guys send them the money, and now you're at, oh my God, I'm having to do the math in my head. I'm only in finance, sorry. Uh, 100,000 plus 100,000 plus 80,000 yeah. or whatever it might yeah. be, right? <clears throat> and then at that point, I mean, that's, and then let's say you get all the way to your CEO, and there's a couple options there. You can roll that into a traditional mortgage. I don't know if that's the right wording or not, or you can modify it at that point. But at that point you have your home and you're paying. So you do pay. Uh, it's not all paid at the end, the interest, right? Or do you pay it? You pay it as like, you go. They, paid as you go. Okay. Yep. Yep. I'm assuming monthly payments or yeah. 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 On what you draw. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now, and, and actually um, there, there are two paths that we go when we look at the financing on that. Um, that what you just described is a very, very straightforward. That's a land purchase with yeah. um, a, a construction. Um, we go that route. However, it's not my more popular route. And, and the yeah. reason why is when you do a loan like that, the appraised value can be no more than the, the, the appraisal price of the land plus the construction cost. No gotcha. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what we, what we actually do, which is uh, more popular is we kind of do a two-step process because the one thing about this as well is it's not a, a quick 30 day turnaround. Mm-hmm. Uh, anytime yeah. you're dealing with a construction loan, there, there's a lot of moving pieces on it. And, uh, you know, it's just, it, just a degree of difficulty is a little bit um, uh, greater. Yeah. So what, what we look at doing is we actually look at starting at, so let's, let's get you in the land first, right? Um, so do the land. And what we've also found, this is the, the least expensive, most the least money out of your pocket. Mm-hmm. Uh, our t- our typical land loan is only 20% down there. We can close that in 30 days. Okay. I mean, that, that those are some of the easier loans for us to do. Sure. Uh, the lower amounts, uh, it's only 20% down. Um, you know, we don't have to worry about uh, insurance or, or anything like that. Right. Um, 
Now, the value to you as, let's say, a potential uh, home builder is that, one, it, it also gives you time to set up the other moving pieces because mm-hmm. you're going to have to have a lot of parties involved. You got your builder, you got your architect, uh, you know, you got to identify the utilities, especially, if you, you know, like I said, assuming we're starting from the ground up, sure. soil, soil testing, um, your, like I said, your architect work, your, uh, uh, you know, getting the plat map and, and everything done. Yep. All your pin surveys or yeah. Yes. Engineers got to get involved. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hands in the pot for sure. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And then this kind of helps you buy that time because mm-hmm. ultimately, um, and then, so step one is buy the land. You can start making payments on it. Now our goal is for you to only make one or two payments, zero if possible. Um, because what that does is gives you time to get all the, all that extra work done. And then what that also does, it puts you in a position to do a, a, a construction refinance. Okay. Yeah. And that refinance would wrap in the cost of the land. We'll pay that mm-hmm. note off and then we'll uh, escrow the money needed for the construction. Gotcha. Uh, and the other reason why we like it that way is our goal is to make it $0 cash out of pocket. Right. Gotcha. Well, yeah. Plus then we get the benefit of the appraisal can be the you know, is the total package, not just the land plus the construction costs. So we can look at, that's when we got comparables. We can start looking at what's the area selling for. And in many Mm -hmm. cases, um, we're getting the value much, much higher uh, than the, the, you know, because we're considering the future value versus just uh, the cost of land plus the construction cost. Right, right. And that keeps the builder liquid. And that's kind of what you guys are looking at on that point. Yes. Yep, absolutely. I mean, and that's that's funny because a lot of a lot of banks in the banking industries over the decades, the last 20, 30 years especially, have been, you know, erased 2008, you know, yeah. set that aside. They want, the, and Evan and I talk about this all the time because we've had this lecture to us as young younger guys, is, is putting skin in the game, right? We want to yeah. see that you've got, you've got cash. We want you to put that in there with us. We're going to give you a bunch of money. Yeah. We want you to give you, give us some of your money as well. Mm-hmm. And especially as a builder, especially the way construction draws are done, which is basically in arrears, I go yep. and spend all this money. You send an inspector out, verify, yep, he did what he said he did. You can give him the money. Now I've collected the money I've already spent, and now I got to go spend more money again. You're putting the mm-hmm. builder in a position where he's cash poor, at least on one project. Yeah, yeah. And and that's that seems counterproductive to the bank. You're, you're forcing him into a position or he doesn't have any cash, but you want yeah. to make it make sure he can pay. Yeah. So it's it's it's, it's counterintuitive to me, but I like yeah. the way that you're like you see. We want him cash heavy. We don't want him to be out of pocket all this money. Yeah, we want them that's to not good for the us. project. Yeah, we so want you to way, finish. Yeah. I want there. no delays. You are. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I got to yeah. pick up a quick yeah. side yeah. job to make some cash. Yeah. Exactly. And now yeah. he's pushed us exactly. It only and, takes and, too many jobs. Yeah. yeah. And you know, the other thing I would say, it's very, very common in uh, containers. It's generally, it's these smaller builders. It's, mm-hmm. you know, the big guys, mm-hmm. they're building these million dollar homes and, right. you know, they're, they're cash rich. They, uh, you know, they do the whole project and they get one lump, ch- uh, lump sum, uh, some check. Yeah. Most cases we're talking small, small man, sh- uh, you know, two, three man shops uh, with mm-hmm. a lot of subcontractors. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, no, totally. Yeah. And, and so now luckily we are pretty quick though. We, we kind of take pride that we think we can in most, most scenarios, unless you're really, really far out in the, in the sticks. Um, if you request a payment on Monday, um, we send the inspector and, and that inspector, they're not like a, um, a code or quality. It's, it's more like a checkbox. Like, Hey, they said they poured the foundation. Is there a foundation there? Right. Boom, they take a quick picture of it. They yeah, check man. it off. And then we can release the funds by Friday. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So it'll go okay. pretty quick. But yeah. as you guys will know, <laughs> which, um, a week seems quick. But when you got subcontractors knocking on your door saying, hey, oh, yeah. <laughs> or, or we You're need to trying to beat weather. Product. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You know, it what is a- funny talking about, let me, I'll, I'll say this just real quick. Uh, you know, it's been this weird, antiquated thought about money, skin in the game, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm glad to hear you guys kind of talking about this because it shows that there's a, an evolution of thought in terms of lending. <laughs> and, you know, in, in all this, for what I'm used to, which is auto finance, you know, forever, it was like down payment was king, yeah. right? If you, because it does two things. One, there is commitment, right? You don't want to default on that because you don't get your down payment back. So the buyer is is attached to this loan. They're going to do everything they can because they don't want to lose their $7,000, mm-hmm. right? The first six months. Um, 
And it puts the bank in a good position in the event that they get this, you know, asset back or not yep. asset, but get back the, you know, the, the collateral. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> but at a certain point, there is a threshold where it just doesn't make sense. In right. I am a buyer and I have 10,000 in cash um, and I'm buying the car at book at wholesale book or, or back of book, even before the down payment. Um, which isn't always the case, but sometimes. Um, I don't need too much. The bank isn't in the business of wholesaling vehicles. It's in the business yeah. of financing it and paying interest, uh, or, or you, pay, the, the applicant paying interest on the loan yeah. over a certain amount of time. And it's like, you don't want to build a business model off of you know, hooking vehicles and taking them to auction and yeah. trying to get your money back. It's not a good model. No, that, so you, a, they lose money. <laughs> yeah. And it's like at a certain point, you just want to recoup your losses uh, without being out of, out of pocket. And I would rather have $5,000 down and keep $5,000 in that person's pocket to make a $300 car payment, yeah. you know, and you start, you're starting to see some evolution in that where, you know, there's discussions where banks are saying, uh, take, take X amount of money and put it aside, which in an account, which we can draw from, right? So if you had 10,000, put 5,000 down, put 5,000 in a place we can draw from. And at $300 a payment, I can get years out of this loan. And we're just as good mm -hmm. as long as we're making the payments. And it's always been a weird thought that the more money you put down, the better. And, and it does still to this day, yeah. but it's just kind of like, there's a threshold where mm -hmm. I want to make sure you have money to make car payments yeah. right. or- to pay for the car breaking down or for that other thing that would compete with that car payment, whether it's problems with your houses. I want you to be liquid enough to be able to be stable and make car payments. I don't want it all in the vehicle, you know? Yep. Um, yeah. Same kind of true in housing a little bit as well. Yeah, I think you bring up a real good point. Um, you know, I, a lot of times I'll have people come to me and they say, hey, Troy, we just sold our house. We have 100,000 we're gonna put into this project. Um, one of the very first things I tell them, I said, have you ever done a construction project before? <laughs> and one it, check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, nope, but I, I tell them, okay. I said, in, in a construction project, cash is king. Mm -hmm. And you want to hold on to that, ca your cash as long as you possibly can. And, and so I always encourage whatever the minimum down payment is for a construction project, let's put that in, you know, yep. it's 20% mm -hmm. of the land. Hold on to that cash because you're going to need it. Something yep. will come up. I don't care mm -hmm. what, what it is, pipes are going to break, uh, there's tree roots, there's, uh, oh, we didn't know we had to go that deep with the foundation, whatever the case is. Someone drives into the home, yeah. a drunk driver. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's exactly. been fun. Yeah. Um, oh, or, or cost of lumber goes up, right? <laughs> cost of, exactly. <laughs> that's never well, happened. Cost of lumber <laughs> triples, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you want to be in a good cash position. So that way you can buy yourself out of that problem, right? And then, um, you, you know, because something comes up, boom, hey, I've got the cash, I got the reserves. I, I buy myself out of that problem. Now, if you're fortunate and nothing happens, you've got that reserve of cash. At the end of the loan process, you can actually buy down the loan um, and there's no cost. Yeah. And we actually reconfigure it to reallocate your payments out. You get to do that one time for free. So let's say you, you carried $50,000 um, for the project. You didn't use it. At the end, you can apply that towards the loan principal. Okay. And, and recast that loan. Gotcha. So um, like I said, and that's, um, but I guarantee you'll spend it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's <laughs> you, almost you always, always that way. There's not many builders, especially in this part of the industry, because again, like you said before, container construction is, is drawing more of the smaller builders, but also more of the DIY kind of, yep. you know, people trying to get to build their own home to keep costs down. Yep. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those deals where it becomes almost, um, yeah, you, you don't understand what you're going to get to. There's not many builders that have that control so dialed in that there's not going to be any overhead costs that comes out of pocket. Yep. That contingency fund is not dipped into. Um, and, and even in the best of them, I mean, something comes up and we've had wacky weather here the last two months of, you know, mountain, mountain construction, especially has been yep. you know odd flash flooding. That's just like destroyed homes that are half built. Um, yeah. You just never know what's going to. I mean, it's, it's a business the of uncertainty, shuts down and they can't uh, deliver a product. You can't get your. Yeah. You can't get it. You can't get supply. Absolutely. I mean, that just you don't know. I mean, yeah. we live in a weird world now, and there's I, I'm buffering my contingencies even higher, yeah. just because there's like things I've never seen before. I'm like I I have more unknowns, and that's yeah. 
That's a big yeah. deal. Now, right off the top, the bank requires that we build in a 10% contingency. Right. Okay. No matter what, for yep. every single project that we do, unless unless you have a couple million dollars in reserves or, or you know, you sure. prove yeah. that you've got the reserves <laughs> on your own. Right. But automatically, we build that uh, a 10% in. Um, and it's the exact same principle. If you need it, you can draw on it. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't need it at the end of the loan, it trues up to what you actually spent. Gotcha. Oh, okay. That makes yeah. sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it's a whole lot easier to go down on the loan. Yes. Um, versus if, I, if we have to like requalify you because you, uh, and I've had to do this before and it's painful. Mm -hmm. Hey, Troy, we, we need $50,000 more. So right. we have to go through and requalify you. Hey, any change in your income? And um, it's a lengthy process. It's almost like doing the loan over again. Well, I was going to um, say, I got a question on that. Um, as far as, Sometimes, and I actually know every project right yeah. now that I'm doing you know, and the homeowner wanted yeah. to do that. Yeah. It, do, do you, are you, I know when, when you get to this point, it's like, we got to start, a, it's a brand new loan basically, right? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not, you're not like just adding funds to a current yeah. construction loan. You have to do a whole brand new loan. I don't think some builders even understand that. Yep. You got to start all over in the middle of a project or, you know, 75% of the project. That's, that's a nightmare to be able yes. to do that. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, um, and we try to avoid it. Like you said, yeah. we try. Well, so a couple of things is that one, we, um, we do a, a really good job of vetting the builders that we work for. And you had talked mm. about do it yourself. Cause that's the right. first thing people come to me and say, Troy, I can do this. I, uh, I've read a book once. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> oh TV. yeah. Um, our construction loans are not do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you're listening to the Built by Bailey's have... podcast. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah you, you have to have uh, a licensed and insured and we check references. So yep. um, we're working with them. And we, and I always like it. I like to have a very a good pool of builders that I work with um, for a couple of reasons, because I mean, I get calls like you wouldn't believe um, people just, they find me first and sure, I love sure. to be able to point them to the builder and say, hey, here's a couple of builders we worked with in the past that mm -hmm. kind of get it, that understand the process, work in your area or whatever, whatever the case might be where it's a good fit. Right. Right. Um, but you want a good builder that, you know, that, um, that has the appetite for this and that kind of the, the experience, because the more experience you're going to have, um, the better off you're going to be as far as forecasting what could go wrong. Yeah, for sure. That yeah. makes sense for DIY folks, but what if you're just someone who's willing to build Right. Mm -hmm. um, but uses somebody like Colorado Container Homes. Is Colorado Container Homes now the builder? Well, it, it, you bring up a really, really good point. And that's another one of these nuances you just mm -hmm. have to understand about it. Typically speaking, typically speaking, when you're looking mm -hmm. at container home purchase, there's two aspects of it. There's the site work, which is mm -hmm. like your, uh, your foundation and your utilities. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> And that's generally your general contractor who's licensed and insured. And that's who we're, we're paying. Right. right. Okay. In, yep. in most cases, when they're building off site, they're just another vendor. You know, think of it right. just like with appliances, or cabinets, or whatever. Yep. They just happen to be building the home. Right. Or yeah. most of it, at least. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so, what happens in our loan process, you get one general contractor of record. Mm -hmm. All the funds go to that general contractor. Meaning if they get any subcontractors, we pay the contract, our, the GC first, and then they would pay the subcontractors. Um, right. Now, in the case of uh, modulars or um, containers, we could do a, a separate check to the, to the manufacturer of that. Right. And, Got and, it. and have its own separate draw process. But so, it's the same concept as, as me going to a prefab company and, yes. and building it the same way. I'm still a GC. I still have all the yep. site work. I still have oversight of the entire project. I've just got a bunch of guys in the factory framing up a house for me and delivering yep. it. Yep. Yeah. Inspected yeah. out there and then brought it's over. Most now, yeah, inspections out there. Yeah. Yeah. Now the other lo lo small loophole, um, some people take advantages, but then the, um, you know, cause like I had a guy, he's like, man, Troy, I lay tile for a living. I can lay tile for this thing. Um, I said, well, Hey, just go back to your builder and just see if you can become their subcontractor for right. that aspect of the job. Yep. Uh, yep. Some people have the appetite. <laughs> most people don't. I find most of the time, even those guys, they get to that point and they want nothing to do with it. They've got other jobs. They've got other, yep. they've got their life ahead of them. And at that point in the project, they, they're just like, finish, please just finish, just finish yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And you want it, you know, um, continuous, you know, as far as um, the, the fits and it matches the quality mm -hmm. that's already in the container as well. Cause right. I mean, you know, that, that's the thing you, you need to, it, it needs to look good. You want to feel proud about it. And, uh, you know, cause everyone's going to want to come see it. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. And yeah. I think there is, I mean, I know 
me even being in the industry with Shane for well over a decade now, it's still, and we, uh, let me back up. One of our previous podcasts, we had the CEO, her name is Audrey Gru- Grubesic, oh, yep. um, who's with Modular SureSight. And it was something that I even got hung up on. I'm like, wait, are you the builder or not the builder? She's like, well, I'm, we're the general conduit, we're the builder. Yeah. But we're going to use uh, and work with, we have a dedicated line with a modular builder. I'm like, so you're the builder for the builder, you know? And it was just kind of like, well, like, how would that work? And then yeah. obviously as we got talking about it, it made sense. But I think for the average listener to who, especially when you're talking about cabins, which is something yes. that, you know, Shane mm-hmm. and I are interested in. Um, it's like, this is a perfect model for something like that, where you have, you know, your site is not in your neighborhood. It's not in the city. It's up the mountain over the dirt road. It's a trickier lot to build. You know, it, I'm talking about Colorado as the example here, but <clears throat> it's buildable mm-hmm. and it's hard to get general contractors up there. It's hard to get the subs up there. It's hard to get the trades up there because it's hours away from where they live. Yep. So building off site works really, really well. And then you add the element of a container, which gives you some, in my opinion, easier or maybe more options for foundation mm-hmm. um, to where on those trickier sites. So it all seems to line up. And I think there's generally some interest with people, especially with secondary homes or turning them into investment properties, which I want to talk to you about. Um, Where it's like, well, this is a good model. I'm not a builder. Do I need to find a general contractor? Can I get with Colorado Container Homes? Can they just do it all? And that would be one of my first questions. And maybe it's more of a question for Colorado Container Homes than it is for you. But do they have general contractors who work, they work with, that do the site work so that way and do all of that so that way they can focus on building off site. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Um, great question. And, and this comes up all the time. And, you know, as soon as we can kind of get past this in theory as far as the way it works, yeah. it's like the light bulb goes off and you're like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, I get that. <laughs> all um, right. So, an example of let's say Colorado Container Homes, and um, they do a little bit of both. Um, it just depends on their schedule. They're not mm-hmm. a huge shop. So, it's not like they've got 10 crews of guys going out to right. these sites. So if mm-hmm. they have the bandwidth, they would, and, and, and the distance is right, and the location is right, they could probably look at doing uh, the, the site work as well mm-hmm. as the factory work. Gotcha. Um, yeah. The other value of doing it this way as well is when you are looking at, um, let's say if you're going up to the mountains, um, it's always kind of nice to have someone um, who's familiar with the inspectors of that township. Right. Mm, yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, yeah. you know, they know Bob because, hey, I've worked with Bob oh, yeah. 10 times and I know exactly what he's looking for. We can have a conversation over a glass of beer. Uh, yeah. Right. Up in the mountains, this out. is how it works quite a bit. Oh, it's, 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 it's so a good old boy point. network. Yep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. We actually, I got that advice from a realtor where I was looking at an A-frame up there. He's yeah. like, I want you to come up and meet the guy the, the, uh, uh, for the uh, building. Yep. Uh, department for the county i was like you want me to meet him yeah it's just important that he knows you're not up here just like i'm like yep. what i mean i'll submit plans he's like no no evan it's good if you come up and like have a beer with them yeah. like, this yep. is crazy yeah. absolutely yeah. especially in that foundation work because you yeah. just yeah. never know what they're going to want because you know like mm-hmm. you said we have so many choices with uh containers mm-hmm. um, and they've got some great technology out there but a lot of the old school guys well that's not what we've done before and, yeah you know, no totally yeah yeah. Um, one of the questions I have for you is um, talk about investment property versus, you know, doing this for your primary residence. If somebody wanted to have a, a yep. second home or and if they like, where does the word investment, where does it go from having a second home yep. or a second property into an investment? Yep. Yep. Excellent question. So generally speaking, so there's three categories we'll talk about when we're talking about lending. There's your primary residence. Mm-hmm. There's a, a second home, and then anything other than that would be an investment property. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> so both my construction and um, well, my construction loan is exclusively exclusively for a primary and second home. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Now, um, now, does that mean it, uh, it has to be your second home permanently? No. <laughs> right. You can, yeah. You know, and and then there's certain there's guidelines that we have to follow as far as what qualifies as second home. They, I believe it has to be like over 50 miles from your prime, um, uh, from your your prime uh, primary home. Right. And um, generally meets that criteria. Um, 
And, you know, the other part too, because a lot of people say, hey, it's going to be second, but I'm an Airbnb. It. I'm going to get some income. Can I count it? <coughs> Not on a second home. You can't, you, you cannot use subject property uh, rental for any of your uh, qualification uh, income. Sure. Gotcha. That becomes right. investment at that point. Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. Now you can always convert it. You know, like I said, um, you know, let's say you start out and say, hey, I want it to be um, uh, my second home. I've got my primary here in Denver and I want a cabin in the mountains. It's going to be a second home. Now, you have to qualify for both payments. We have mm -hmm. to, you know, worst case scenario, we sure. say, hey, you got 100% of your home payment you're making right now, and you're going to pick up this new payment, plus all your other credit debts, car payments, credit cards, and all that. Mm -hmm. So you have to qualify mm -hmm. uh, for it. And it's a, it's a little bit steeper uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. We're going to want better credit uh, scores. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to do this at a 620 credit score. Right, right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, mm -hmm. you got you to have a, bit, a better history. Yeah. What, yeah. what, are, what other, like, Okay, let's talk about skin in the game then for so that type of loan. What, what are you guys looking at on down payments, um, interest rate? I mean, I know you guys have good packages, but yeah, yeah, and a lot of it depends um, on on the individual buyer. So we do, you know, we talk about credit. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, we would like uh, for if we do straight up, if we're looking at straight up construction, ninety percent loan to value okay. um, is a good. But I mean, I've ran it up higher than that, um, up to ninety five percent in some cases, just depending on the size. Um, of the, of the house and the size of the loan and whatnot. Um, generally speaking, they're a whole lot easier. It's a simpler loan. Um, if we can keep it under the conforming loan limits, and in most cases, that's about 548,000. Okay. So that'd be cost of the land plus the cost of the, the project. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can go higher. We can go up to $2 million if we wanted to. It just, it's a simpler loan. Um, it's a 30 year fixed and the rates are really competitive. Um, the, the other thing, the, the nuance with our program. So at this point, we'd be talking about my bank's construction loan. Mm -hmm. And with this, you actually get a discount um, on, on the cost of the loan, uh, the shorter the construction period. So our standard construction period is 12 months. Okay. All right. But let's say like I've got one in East Detroit. This is easy. We're going to build, uh, they're building a cabin down in Texas. Um, and it's going to be done in uh, probably six, seven weeks. They're going to ship it up here and they're just going to set it down on the foundation that they're building at the same time. Uh huh. Yeah. So we're talking maybe a six month, maybe a six month construction. Period. Right. Right. And so we're actually going to give actually some uh, credits within that because it's only going to be a six month construction loan. Okay. Versus a 12 gotcha. month construction loan. Okay. Gotcha. Totally yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, if, does it matter? Uh, let me give you an example. Um, you're working with me, Shane, and another person. This is kind of would be our scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and we would all individually go on the note. Um, we don't, wouldn't have to form, if we wanted to all share a second property, maybe that's yeah. a better way to say it. Um, how would we go in together on that? Where we say, hey guys, let's all go in and build a cabin that all three of our families can use. Yeah. Um, walk me through that. We do, we, would we need to form an LLC? Would we individually get approved? Would you get approved as a group? Um, yep. How would how does that work? Sure. So, and I get asked this a lot because that's a great solution. You know, mm -hmm. um, so when you look at a loan, you can we can always add borrowers and co-borrowers. Mm -hmm. um, since it's your second home, we don't have to worry about occupancy as far as because uh, you know sometimes you have to have a, a an occupying borrower. In this case, oh, yeah. what would happen, let's say if you had three people, we would pull all three, you know, all three credit scores, all three mm -hmm. debts, um, and we would have to fit that in as one file. Okay. Now, as of right now, you, you, you apply as individuals, you cannot apply as an LLC. Now, there, gotcha. there's, okay. there's talks about maybe down the road where you might be able to do that, but right now, mm -hmm. it's three individuals. Um, with the credit score, it's kind of funny uh, and unfortunate. We, you have to take the lowest credit score of the, of the three. three people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I, like I, I've had a couple of guys come to me, hey, I've got two guys at 800 and then the other guys at 620. We got to <laughs> take the lowest one. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it works. So pick um, your pick your poison or pick your package well so you don't get poisoned, exactly. so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Choose your friends wisely. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or your relatives, right? Or your relatives. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So could so, you do, so you only do two, your primary and your secondary for that yep, group. Yep. Um, could they turn around if they wanted to? And this is why I'm curious about the investment mm -hmm. part of it. So then it, let's say it rolls into a fixed 30 year, right? Yep. Um, 
could they sell it? How does it look selling oh, yeah. down the road? Sell it immediately? I yeah, mean, is question. it yeah, an investment? Well, yeah, let, and let's back up one one quick sec. So mm-hmm. with yeah. this, you'd have three people on the loan, mm-hmm. on the note, okay. and then chance are, and then you're going to have all three people on title, right? At right. The register yep. at the county. Yep. Now, that's how it gets set up. Now, you can then at that point, now the loan's in place. We don't touch that. That's you're just making payments now mm-hmm. from the ty- uh, from the, the deed perspective, then I've seen people create that LLC. They quit claim it to an LLC. Qu- yep. Yep. Yeah. I've had people ask after- me about that. So I was yep. going to ask that. Okay. Got it. Yep. 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 Then what you could, then you could, then it gives you a couple of different options. One, you can keep the loan in place, mm-hmm. whatnot. Um, you could always sell, uh, you know, there's sure. no limit, limit on that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there, there might be tax ramifications, but I'm not a tax guy. You would have right. to find a person. Um, I've also seen where you, Hey, it's built. We've got some, and you get instant equity in it because our market, that's the way things are working <laughs> right. right now. It's right. absolutely right. You, you could look at maybe a commercial loan at that point. If you mm. want to get everyone off the note and look at maybe the next project, just gotcha. some of the options that you sure. can look at. Okay. Yeah. Um, but in the fun part is there's, I mean, there's 10 different ways that you can do this thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cause it's something we're interested in, I guess, really, two things one we we want a cabin for the family and yep. when we're all three families aren't using it um we would short-term rental it right yep. um and maybe i would imagine between three families especially like these three families in this example we'll be up there quite a bit somebody right. will be yeah. right yeah. um whether they're fishing or mountain biking or just getting away from work or, or working from up there even mm-hmm. um People will be up there, but we would short-term rental. So we, we want that, but we also understand the market and the opportunity to build new inventory mm. um, and we could sell these, um, yeah. which is uh, the whole other side of the coin for us. Um, and if we were moving forward, let's say with Colorado Container Homes and you as kind of our partner in this, that's where it starts to all of a sudden, like even in the word I just use, partner. You know, it's kind of like, well, is this investments? What is this? Um, and if we sold the home, um, let's say we kept it for six months just to enjoy it. And then we sold it for profit. Yeah. And then we said, let's build another one. That's mm-hmm. fun. Well, let's build one up here. We can use it for the summer and then we'll sell it. Yeah. Um, does each time that that happens, let's, for simple purposes, you know, uh, without getting too complicated, talking about like quick claiming it to an LLC, like all that kind of stuff. In theory... Each time, if we sold it, would the very next one again be the second home? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That it, um, in theory, that's the way yeah. it worked. And you kind of mm-hmm. kind of bring up a uh, kind of interesting point to kind of think about a little bit <laughs> because you know once you 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 know you declare it right at closing, you say, "Yep, this is a second home for that." Um, mm-hmm. There's technically not really a time frame on how long it's got to be a second home. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, then at six months, you could sell it. Uh, mm-hmm. You could you could also say, hey, you know what? We really just, we want to make this an investment property. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. the, the value behind that now, uh, a whole different, we could have probably a whole different podcast on this, um, <laughs> right. but you're looking at the difference between short-term and long-term rental. Yep. yep. And what yep. Um, the bank would give you credit for um, mm-hmm. be, um, because, well, let's just make it real quick. Bank does, bank banks do not recognize right now short-term rental. Um, until it's right. filed on your tax returns. Yep. Interesting. Yep. I knew there was a yep. holding period or not yep. a holding period, but a time period, but I didn't know what it was. So yep. once you show it on your tax return, yep. So yep. they mm-hmm. could do it from, let's say, third and fourth quarter. That, is yep. that enough? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You could, yeah, long, like I said, as long as it's on your tax returns, the, the, um, the, um, the other choice you have is then you have to have, if you have a long term lease in place. So let's say let's say you want to you built it. Um, you said, ah, we're going to rent this out. We have a long term uh, in place. Then we would mm-hmm. take that and we would actually give that credit because then at that point we could take the rental income on that property to reduce your debt sure. income. Gotcha. Sure. And then you can say, now okay. okay, now we want to build over in this town because this works yep. better mm-hmm. for us. Yep. Of whatever the case would be. Um, right. But you know, obviously, long term rental it, it's certainly more stable. Um, but it's not mm, as high, right. you know, because I mean, these Airbnb dollars are just crazy. What people just are destro- off these yeah, it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. insane, which is why it's so enticing for so many yes. people to do that, which is why it's always enticing for Evan and I to look at these for ourselves, but also to build them as specs 
and go ahead and sell them to somebody else who wants to use that as an Airbnb. Yeah. yeah. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm building one that I'm working on a cabin right now, just outside I had Oh Springs. So oh, cool. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Still doing the, the land piece, doing all the del- due diligence with the land. Uh-huh. And, and so is forth. it going to be a short term? Are you going to also use it as a short term rental? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm yeah. actually going to do, um, <laughs> I'm going to combine the best of, uh, I'm going to build a cabin with an ADU. Um, <laughs> oh, perfect. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nothing like being your own client. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, let's actually talk about the ADU um, mm-hmm. a little bit. Because uh, that was one of the first things Shane and I identified as a, as a possibility of using containers, right. especially in the city of Denver. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and uh, which one came first? Was it these both happened together, whether it was, you know, finance my container home or was it the ADU first or did they kind of just work together or for, was it if we're going to do that, we might as well do this? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the, the funny part is I would say if it really all started, I had a close friend that was um, they were building tiny homes down uh, in Colorado Springs. Yeah. And um, mm-hmm. once you know, I got into this business, I mean, man, there's just not a lot of inventory. We got to kind of think of something new and different. Um, the friend, they, they work for a big factory down there. Now they build them themselves. Um, so I kind of dove into that and I found that the, the, you know, those are basically, those are like car loans when you do a tiny house, Mm -hmm. right? They're on an Mm -hmm. axle. Um, they don't meet, uh, any of the the guidelines as far as the window size, the, uh, the wind load and, and uh, and snow load and all that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I quickly abandoned, but I start going to these shows and we, well, what can I finance? Well, I can finance an ADU, Uh um, and, you know, the ADU, that's the, um, the industry term, but, you know, people call them all different things, mother-in-law apartment, uh, mm. granny flat. Um, mm. <laughs> for some of yeah. the older folks, they'll, under, they'll remember uh, in Happy Days, Fonzie lived on, uh, in an ADU. It was that apartment <laughs> above the garage, right? Yep. The, the yeah. Fonzie so, like, Carriage house. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. For our listeners, exactly. ADU, just in case you don't know, is accessory dwelling unit, correct? Right. Yeah. Yep. So this is a structure, think in your backyard. Uh, permanent structure. Um, that's why they call it like granny flat or carriage house or whatever. So it is a detached property mm. on your lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And most of them are done with garage at the, at the bottom because it's, mm-hmm. they're, they're using it as, you know, two killing two birds with one stone. Yep. Basically, yep. They have living space above a garage is the most yeah. common way to do yeah. it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, um, what now a couple of nuances with that is that when we do the loan, so one, then I can look at either construction loan or renovation loan because the house is already in place. Oh, sure. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, that's a Fannie Mae loan. The rates tend to be a little bit better. Um, but what's really nice about it is that takes away the, um, the, the constraint of the square footage mm-hmm. because the house already is 1,200, 2,000, whatever square feet. So if you wanted to just drop a 400 square foot unit, you could. Okay. That right. makes sense. Yeah, yep. we're doing it. the yep. um the the probably the big thing on that is every county uh, or city um, are different as far as who's going to allow it. Yeah, um, yeah. you know you're going to make sure your neighbors are cool with it. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yep. um, I would love to see certainly more people use um uh, a container for that solution because you know the, all the benefits, right? Um, you can just drop it and what now you you somewhat um eliminate the the ability to be able to have a garage on bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, the, I have not seen any plans for anyone, you know, putting a, a garage on bottom and putting a container on top mm-hmm. of it. So well, I've I, done a couple, I've seen some they're, they're getting there. Yeah. 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 They will they're making the garage out of containers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so you and can just build, drop another yep. container on top. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's actually yeah. a great solution if people would look more at it. Yeah. 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 Um, generally speaking, um, like I said, every city is a little bit different. Sometimes it just depends, um, and that's one of the very first things you have to do when you're looking, whether you're looking at building a cab in the mountains or you building these is get with your city first. Yes. You know, kind of understand yeah. what their expectations are, yep. because sometimes they're saying, once again, it's that it's a modular build. It's a mm-hmm. modular. <laughs> yep. um, but sometimes they'll say, yeah, you can build modular. You just can't have a metal uh, surface. Uh, <laughs> so on a container ADU, um, uh-huh. you're the lender. Um, do you work with, I mean, does Colorado Container Homes do container ADUs as part they of- They certainly could. They, yeah, they, they certainly could. could. 
And um, I've got one. In Not that you're supposed to speak on their behalf, but <laughs> I figured it would be somebody that could well, it's closer to the question. Yeah, because yeah, right, right now, what, what we're seeing in the ADU market, it, it's it's pretty amazing <laughs> on what they're spending on these stick build ADUs. Oh, yeah. Um, they are, I mean, the price ranges I've seen, I mean, the um, as low as $200,000, um, and that's uh, construction grade, that's bare bones, um, yep. up to 400000 for yep. these ADUs. Yep. You have to understand the house, the primary house is already worth 800 to a million. Mm-hmm. So bolting on a $400,000 second home in that same lot, it's not that big a deal. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, now on the ADUs, because um, the use of the ADU is vast. Yep. Some people may use it as a office, mm-hmm. um, uh, a gym, a granny yep. flat that has utilities, a bathroom, mm-hmm. um, you know, and for, 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 context here a little bit. So I have a friend that um, works full time, but is a personal trainer, um, yep. Stacia Shane. Mm-hmm. And her personal training business is getting way big, um, mm-hmm. where she actually converted her basement, I believe, uh, into a gym, like a gym gym, like mm-hmm. the flooring, the mirrors, everything. And she runs classes at it there. And um, when she's not at work, and she's now discussing building an ADU in her backyard to be a gym. And she's got a pretty good size lot. And um, are there the use of the ADU or the determined use of the ADU? Does that change? Does it have to be a granny flat? Could it be a gym? Could it be a home office or an art studio or a man cave, you know, or a she yeah. shed, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Once again, this could be an entirely different podcast. <laughs> sure. Sure. I sure. I need um, you to answer that question, Troy, in about two minutes. Go. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, all right. So one of the things that I see is just what you talked about, especially in this Denver market. They say, Troy, we bought our house three, four years ago. It was my myself and my wife. Well, now we're growing. We're getting bigger. Uh, we've got kids. Um but we can't afford that next step, that next level house, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because the, the we're, we're priced out of it. We like where we we like where we live. We like the neighborhood. Um, we just need for that room. expensive con, uh, addition. Yeah. Yes. So yes. what what they would look at? Uh, so there's two aspects. You, you 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 bring up ADU and just like you said, ADU is accessory dwelling unit. Mm-hmm. The, um, now that you have to be zoned for. Um, you have to right. check with your individual cities zoning laws. Uh, it's rapidly changing when I started, maybe 12 cities allowed it. Now I think we're up to like 21 cities yeah. allow it. Denver's rapidly approving a- the use of ADUs. Um, but let's say you, you, um, it's not a dwelling unit. Let's just say it's a the man cave or it's just in a, a living room, a, a mm-hmm. detached living room. That's mm-hmm. an accessory unit. Right. Okay. And those are pretty much, uh, unless you have an HOA. Now that's the caveat. If you have an HOA, you, they're not going to let you do it. <laughs> that gets really messy. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Once again, a whole other podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you don't have an HOA or if you can get approval from your HOA, um, mm-hmm. you can just drop um, and it could be modular. It could be stick build. It could be mm-hmm. container. It could be whatever you want. And just you're adding square footage to your house. Right. Right. Um, and unless you finance you're- that. Yeah. Yeah, unless you're in unincorporated Boulder County, unincorporated Boulder County has a whole nother game plan for what any of that is. And that's yeah. anyone listening to this that's in Colorado, just, just understand that is one of the stickiest places to try and play <laughs> that game. So yeah. regardless of being zoned that way or not, it's not exactly all it's cracked up to be, shall yeah. we say. So be careful. Yeah. yeah. So you know, there is a difference between accessory dwelling unit and an accessory unit and the accessory unit. So like in the example, my friend, in theory, could finance a gym in her backyard. But would that then be an investment? No, Since no, if she that runs would all a fall under the primary residence. Mm-hmm. OK, got it. You're, just, got you're it. adding square footage to your primary so residence yeah, on and your lot. I, I'm expecting this th- this circumstance is just like this um, to go up tremendously because of COVID. I mean, yes, how many people 100%. were, hey, I'm going to work from home now. I'm like, hey, yeah. I kind of like it, but I don't want the dog barking in the background. Can't right. have the kids playing around <laughs> in the background. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've already or, sent a text to my wife. Hey, kids <laughs> dribbling a basketball upstairs. I hear dogs running around. Where I'm, are you? Where I'm in the basement, <laughs> which just seems like there is a... Uh, 
a whole pod of kids upstairs having a birthday party and it's just two kids walking around. Yeah. 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 Where's the parade going? No, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you need that. You need um, now. And, and once again, there's a gray area with this as well, um, because so an accessory dwelling unit, that is a separate house. The intent, you can rent it uh, short term, long term, um, and, or you could put family members in it. You can extend room. An accessory unit um, isn't designated as dwelling, but you could put your immediate family in there. So let's say you had uh, right. a, a child. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think about this all the time because it's near and dear to my heart. Let's say you have a special needs child mm -hmm. and you know they're never going to... Um, they're never going to be able to live on their own, but right. you, they want to give them some, uh, some independence. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you could put them out in that unit as, a, as they get older, where they exactly. can Exactly. Yep. Um, exactly. Yeah. We're already or planning the, for one of those with one of my friends down the road. Yep. That's the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Or an aging parent, grandparent. You know? Right. The, I mean, yeah. the cost of uh, assisted living is just skyrocketed. Oh, it's insane. Skyrocketed. Yes. yes. No, yeah, for sure. And you know, especially going back to the containers, this is, to me, a huge advantage for either ADUs or accessory units is, you know, just the impact to uh, during the construction process. You know, mm -hmm. you think about going and, 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 and building them off site, right? Yep. It's you come in, you do whatever foundation you're going to do, and then you just go back to living your life. There's not excavators necessarily in your backyard. There's not mm -hmm. all of this you know, your back half of your house is ripped off and plasticked up because you're getting ready for the addition. The neighbor's giving you dirty looks. Oh, oh yeah, 100%. Yeah. And yeah. then one day the sink just comes in and gets craned in and set, and it's like you're done, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I think there's a huge advantage to that. But um, which part of your business right now um, – seems to be going more than the others accessory dwelling a little bit more busy than people building homes i would assume it would yeah. be so i get well i mean between the two between containers and adus i get hundreds of calls a month <laughs> yeah. because i can do these I, I i i work let's see container homes i can do in about like 16 different states so yeah. i mean i've got mm -hmm. one going in north carolina right is now. colorado one of them yes, yes. <laughs> <Perfect. laughs> all right good um but, and they're so trendy and they're always calling and, uh, you know, kicking the tires and, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about it. Um, so I get a lot of calls, um, but it's a long process. It's not like, um, like when you're buying a home, you can, you know, be in it within 30 days. Right. That's not going to happen with this. Right. Yeah. Um, the ADU, um, because they tend to be, um, well, educating people about what an ADU is a big thing. And, and the more people become educated, because every single person I tell what I do, they're like, I need one of those. <laughs> yeah, for yep. sure. Whether it be oh, yeah. for a mom, for an office, wherever. Mm -hmm. um, and what I find is I get um, uh, my pipeline, if you will, of people looking at ADUs. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of people in there, but they're all different points. They take it's a longer term process, mm -hmm. you know, where they get the architect involved. They get um, they got to get the zoning. Sometimes they have to uh, you know get a zoning change in Denver, um, six to eight months to, to, to do something like that. Mm -hmm. It's a longer process. Um, so, I mean, right, right this second, and I think it's because of summer, um, I think I've got more ADUs going. Um, sure. Yeah, but, that makes more sense. I mean, there a lot of places in Colorado, or if they weren't already zoned this way, are getting rezoned, and, and municipalities are being really lenient about allowing them to rezone them because for the for the department itself, it's more income. It's tax money. Yes. It's permit tax. It's... It's, you know, if you're doing addition, you're getting property, more property tax on it. Well, it's beneficial. and the schools love it uh, because m in most cases, if it's a long-term rental, you, let's say a single parent with a child, that right. child's now in that school system. Exactly. That they didn't have, and that's dollars. That's, that's dollars, dollars for, for them. Exactly. Yep. hundred percent. Right. And that's, and that's where I'm seeing, I mean, I, I live in a town um, up here where most of old town is, was zoned that way from the beginning. And there's a lot yep. of minor cabins, but that's exactly what's happening is they're buying the little minor cabin, which most of them probably need to be torn down anyway. Yep. Um, half of those at least don't even have an actual foundation, but they're living in that they're doing the ADU and then they're moving into the ADU, scraping the home and building yes. the home. Um, mm. But the problem with that is one cost is in insane as far as being stick built, but the timing is also a really big deal. Um, and so yep. I've been leaning towards with clients on not just modular, but, you know, the other modular, which we like to call shipping container construction as an option, cost goes down, timeline goes down. And now more people are going to be able to buy those lots. And as a realtor too, 
that's huge for me because I can now really sell them on buy this lot yeah. because I can show you the construction timeline and cost. And it's half of what someone else has told you. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I t and, and I think that's a brilliant strategy, especially for someone that says, Hey, I've got my primary and I want to build, but man, I'm going to make the, the, the new construction, my primary and right. sell my other house. Yep. Yep. Um, but there's a gap in there where you're going to have to make both payments. Exactly. <laughs> yep. No matter and, what. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's, it could be daunting, you know, and even if you could afford it, if you could in, ha make an investment, you could probably put your money in other investment vehicles sure, um, to make a, a better return. Yeah. So I, I think it's an excellent strategy to look at, hey, let's get the land. First thing, let's build the ADU first, mm -hmm. right? Then yep. you're making the payment on that. You've got your primary house. Well, the ADU is done. Maybe you can move into the ADU and sell your house at that point. Right. Why they're building your new main uh, primary residence. Uh-huh. Exactly. Yep. Yep. I got a question. And then, and yeah, then they ahead. move into their primary and they've got a great rental unit right there. Right there. Yeah. Ready to go. Yeah. Kind of along the lines of looking at land and buying and that whole thing. Um, I'll give a extreme example to, uh, and then you can kind of answer the question. But because uh, my question is, is there a minimum price on the land? Mm -hmm. So before it was just give 20% down. What happens if you're looking at a $20,000 lot? Yeah. You know, so, and is that is so are there limits um, to what kind of land and price and stuff that you could be looking at? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you would never think about a minimum, but yeah, there, technically there was a minimum of $10,000. <laughs> so if somebody uh, could give you $2,000. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, from my threshold. perspective, um, yeah. I would do it because I know that I'm going to probably turn around right away um, and do a construction loan on it. Yeah. So yep. let's say there's a two hundred thousand dollar construction loan, yep. and they're looking at um, let's because there's some acres down in like Cripple Creek yep. um, that are beautiful, and I think Cripple Creek is going to have um, continued interest. There's a lot of lots down there now, um, but its proximity to Colorado Springs to me it's like Cripple Creek is almost like uh, Colorado Springs is uh, conifer. Yeah. or evergreen yeah. it's like the it's the next little spot very drivable kind of it's very, very drivable yeah. go through it's woodland park in. very yep. pretty mm -hmm. and right now there's lots down there for an acre for you know fifteen thousand twenty thousand yep. dollars um and no utilities anything like that so assuming you're going to go down and put a cabin or you're yeah. going to move to cripple creek but you're going to downsize um yep. and it's a two hundred thousand dollar construction loan but it's only a twenty thousand dollar lot Mm -hmm. So could somebody give you $4,000 and then just get the construction loan and move forward, paying interest <laughs> yeah. only, roll it into a mortgage? Yeah, technically they could. Now, so a couple of things with this, um, $10,000 minimum loan. Um, maximum is going to be uh, probably $500,000. I can get exceptions, but you know we have to build a real good case. Um, and 50 acres or less. 50 acres or less. 50 okay. acres or less. Now, the big, big, big caveat, it's got to be buildable. Because that, that's the other sure. thing, um, a misconception about container homes. A lot of people, they want to do these off-grid. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. They, and, okay. and there probably is the technology. You know, you probably could get a septic tank. You could probably get, you know, dig a well, get solar, um, and it'd be good. But we're not doing loans on those. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, actually, I'll ask you this. So maybe this is good uh, for our listeners. Mm-hmm. A lot of property up in the mountain, like cabins especially, um, will be septic yeah, um, or well water or yep. whatever. So I think when people hear off grid, they yep. think they, they, their mind first goes to like energy, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And just, well, I'm not going to have solar. But if they have to use septic, if they have to use a well or a cistern maybe, mm -hmm. is that still, is it like all of them could, could it be basically not off grid except for septic um, well, so, or does it yeah, yeah walk us through that yeah so uh, excellent question so uh, yeah off um we do loans for houses and cabins with septic and well uh all the time mm, that, okay. that's not an issue the the big big issue is is the city or county going to give you the co the certificate of occupancy right gotcha. as long as you get the co we can do the loan on it yeah gotcha. uh, in okay. most cases they're not going to give a co if you're uh, completely off grid right right um, gotcha Okay. They and they're not going to force a permit at that point. So really, the, it comes down to our listeners, too, is go talk to your building department before you get started. Once again, yeah. <laughs> do your due diligence, please. Yeah. 
Uh, yes. Yeah. Let me, uh, another question for you. Um, talking about the time frame from when you are making an offer on the land um, and tell the time that you close on the land. So we were talking earlier, maybe 30 days, a, a whole month to go out there, do due do diligence. So when it comes to tying up land, mm -hmm. um, because that's one of, let me take one step back, because that's one of the issues when you're looking at a secondary home or secondary property that is more than an hour away from your house, yep. is getting out there and checking the buildability. Trust me, I've drugged Shane out multiple <laughs> times, hours to go look at a lot to see if we could even build on it, right? And I'm curious if, can you tie up the land and make it contingent on its buildability, the um, your utilities and stuff like that? And then if it doesn't pan out, walk me through that. Is there, do you lose escrow money? Is there like, you see what I'm saying? Oh, we might've lost them again. Oh, it froze up. Yeah. I. Uh, that's maybe a good, you know, Shane. That's a good question. Um, I it, And I know there are certain lenders that have done that in the past per my experience or someone else's. Um, the caveat would be really, again, due diligence, type of construction. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, is there value in flipping it? You know, you, you know how the bank works. What happens if you kill it? What happens if the deal dies? What happens if you can't make a payment? What happens if you get stuck with this land? What are you going to do? Right. right. Um, and the bank's going to say, what's my value? Can I turn it around? Because they're not in the business of selling real estate. Right. They, their business is making money off. Their, their business right. is creating money from nothing. That's yep. interest. Correct. Right. Yeah. But if we have to, you know, what's worst case scenario? You, you do this all the time. What's worst case scenario? Can right. we turn this around? Is this going to be worth it? Um, I'd be curious when Troy gets back on here, what, what he'd say, because I know of lenders that have, have done that. And I know lenders that are tied in with land developers mm -hmm. that have basically a, they, if they need to flip it, they can make a, a quick phone call and they're done. And so it's for them, it's not a big deal. Um, yeah. It's always cause you know, take the lot that we're interested or take any lot. Let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar lot and it's three hours away from Denver. Right. You know, it's like, before I, I would love to tie that lot up right yeah. potentially and can i tie it up when is the when is the 20 percent due at closing um, right. do i have to put it up front what do i got to put into like escrow um because i don't want to uh, decide whether or not it's buildable or not i guess it's like yeah it's like the chicken or the egg can yeah. i tie it up and then go do all of that or do i need to go do all of that before i tie it up well like, i mean um, you know how this market works right now you've you've got to get a contract on something if you think it's going to work and then that, you've got to try and stretch problem, out yeah. stretch out your due diligence period during that contract period mm -hmm. as long as you can now n five years ago you could you could give it 30 45 days and you that'd be plenty of time to figure all that stuff out because to answer your question, the twenty percent is due at closing. I mean, that's yeah, all. Twenty percent is due at closing. Yeah, that you're, you're only you only thing you write to... your escrow check. You know, whatever earnest money you're going to write is due at at seventy two hours from contract in Colorado. So yeah. that's the only thing you're throwing down. the The worst, the um, the tricky part is if you're going thirty to forty five days and all of this stuff right now, the offer might not be accepted. They're going to mm -hmm. say, "No, I, I I need less time than that. I know someone else will come along." And, yeah. and and move quicker on this contract period. So, yeah, because um, it's it is the game, especially within this market. Um, it's hard to, you know, sometimes you want to say, well, that looks really great. I think that's exactly the kind of piece of land or property that I'm looking at, wanting to build on. And it's especially for what we're discussing, which is a second secondary home. Yeah, it's kind of like, well, I want to tie it up because I understand the market, but it's also five hours away. And I want to make sure that when I'm committed, making an offer on the land, going under contract, that kind of thing, can you give yourself the ability to discover that you cannot build on it or it would be too expensive and then back out of that? And what does that mean to the money that, you, that you're responsible for, for tying up the land? And because it seems like it'd be like, okay, well, yeah, we have the 20% down and 
well, let's just start tying up land, you know, and right. then we'll go out there and we'll back out if we feel like it's not going to work. And I don't know what that means for Troy and his in his bank and or how many times they would whether that would affect underwriting like, hey, Evan, you've done this now like six times. You've tied up land and then you've sure. backed out all six times. And on me, on the other end, for devil's advocate, I would say, well, it's five hours away. I don't you know, I don't I don't want to go figure out if I can build on it and then make an offer. I kind of want to get the land tied up and figure it out. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. And that's, and it looks that's, like- that's just contract. That's just the, how the contract's written. They're not going to start underwriting until a certain date anyway. They're going to, you know, you're pre-approved. You're pre-approved listeners <laughs> before you write a contract. <laughs> yes, okay? yes. Yeah. Maybe don't, we should have said that. Yeah. Don't even play that game right now. So you're yeah. pre-approved coming in. The bank says, based on what you've provided <laughs> me, I will give you up to X amount like Troy was talking about. Mm-hmm. But then the due diligence period comes down to how long, and the bank doesn't care if 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 the seller says I'll give you forty five days to go do your due diligence. Sure, we'll sign contract signed. They're still ha- the bank still has their data. The lender still has their date on when they're going to start underwriting. So you're pre approved. There's a commitment started. Title then gets to work and provides that to the lender. And once the lender gets what they see you get past a certain date, they know when to push the button for underwriting. The underwriter is mm-hmm. not going to start until you've basically gone through your due diligence period because right. right. they're waiting on someone like us to say, we're good to go. Right. Um, and yeah. that's, and, and like I said, the trick with all of that is in this, these markets right now is how long do you really, really get with a seller? Um, how long yeah. are they going to give you? Right. Yeah. You know, they may not give you 30 days. Now, again, the lender, just to understand that, Ooh, we got some feedback. Yeah. Here. Let's see. I'll mute him for a sec. Let him set up. But the lender's gonna get. Um, <coughs> the lender's gonna gonna dictate to you ahead of time how long they're gonna need, especially on the underwriting side. Yeah. And, you know, when we get Troy set back up here, you can answer that. But um, it's every lender is a little bit different. Yeah. But that's the trick in this market right now. You're right. Is is you got to grab it, right? Yep. Um, but what happens? Um, yeah. You know, it's they they know <laughs> they yeah. know what no. this market is going to do, J- even on just land in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we've seen a, a few that we've actually taken a look at and said, hmm, this is this is actually a good one. I mean, anything that's good is going to go. And, and then we just, try to organize getting out there and getting people out there, yep. and then it's gone. It's too and late. It's kind of like, oh, yep. man. Um, and sometimes getting out there, especially if you're trying to evaluate the land, can take weeks. And so, yes, yes, it's, it's kind a of longer wo- process. Yeah, no, it is a longer process. And um, but if if you know you, you're seriously interested in building out there, and you just need to get out there, and you need to try to protect your ability to own the land and build on it. Um, mm-hmm. Now that we got Troy back, um, sorry about that, guys. No, no worries. Fine. No, technology's well, fun, isn't it? Yeah, what we're discussing. Yeah, welcome. To I was. I would tell you. I I was listening to you guys. I'm like, oh, I got so much I got to tell you. I'm about. sure yeah. you do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you could hear. So yeah, tell us. Yeah, uh, yeah chime so in here. I, 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 you bring up a really, really good point. The land. Uh, once again, probably a whole other podcast we can do for mm-hmm. this. Oh yeah, uh, mm-hmm. recurring theme. Uh, the land is 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 the trickiest. It's the foundation of us of everything we do. The one thing I tell people um, is that when you find that perfect piece of land. Right, you're like Troy. This is beautiful. It's a great location, great area. Um, you, the that sends red flags up to me, <laughs> okay? Because mm-hmm. here, here's why: is it, if it is truly the perfect piece of land, mm-hmm. if it would have been easy, someone would have built on it 20 years ago. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's always something that's causing it that why someone has not built on it. Mm-hmm. Now. <clears throat> I might be wrong and, you know, but in most cases, like you said, there's a reason, but you, it's up to you uh, um, to do the due diligence. So it's really critical that you are working with a real estate agent that knows what the heck they're doing. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, because it's not the same as a house, right? I mean, house, no. we do inspections and we, uh, um, you know, we can, uh, it's pretty straightforward, right? You get one guy crawls around your attic with a flashlight, boom, Mm -hmm. lands, lands a little more complex. And so you need that due diligence. Yes. Um, me, let me talk about my personal experience. I went under a contract first week in June for a piece of land I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to close until September 27th. 
All right. On the land. Think on about land. that. How many on months that is? Yeah. yeah I, in ninety days is what yep. I um, what I what I. Uh, that way I can do all my, because what I cannot happen is I, I get into this land and I find out, oh, you can't build that, you know, right. you can't build yeah. that ADU, you can't right. drop a container there, yeah, um, because then I, I, I got a piece of land, I got to offload it, right? Yep. But you've tied up that land for 90 yeah, days. Yeah, so you put to your do earnest money down, yeah. but it's pretty common, you know, because there's so much due diligence, you know, you got your soil yes. down. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got to get the survey done. You're going to get all the yeah. utilities marked. Um, mm -hmm. You've got to talk to the building department saying, hey, here's what I'm going to build. Are you going to allow this uh, water uh, up, especially in the mountains? You, you got to figure out, you know, uh, you know, what's the cost of this well going to be? Right. Uh, how far mm -hmm. away, if there are utilities, how far away is a utility pole for me? Because um, yeah. you got to pay by the foot when, yeah. you, right. when you're looking up yeah. the utilities. <laughs> and so um, you just got to make sure you build that in. Um and there's different ways that you can do it, but generally speaking, you know, you've got a, a loan contingency or a loan uh, deadline. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you push that out as far as you, they'll possibly as let you. As far as they'll let you, yeah. Yep. 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 Now, <laughs> they might very well come back and say, no, 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 we know this is good, blah, 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 you know, because they don't want it off the market, but they just have to understand when you sell land, that's just the part of the, the process you have to go through. And, a, and so, if the seller is being unreasonable with timelines, and again, you have to have a realtor that will explain what reasonable is. If they're being unreasonable, Come back to it because yeah. if if they're being unreasonable with you, they're going to be unreasonable with everybody, yep. and you don't want to mess with that. You don't want to push it just because you think, well, we got it. We got to have this ha this land. We've figured out how we can do something with it. Yep. If they're not letting you go past a certain amount of time, that's reasonable. They're not going to sell it. It'll be there later. Keep yep. looking. Come back. They may even call you. I mean, we've seen that happen with us too. Yeah, I oh, uh, yeah. just to kind of you know part of my dude on my land. Uh, funny story is I'm buying this piece of land. And uh, when we're my wife and I are looking at, we're looking at like that's a grave site up there. <laughs> and, and, and we found out there's actually a grave up there on the land. Oh wow! Oh, and gosh. so it, it's a Civil War uh, veteran. Him Whoa. and his dog are buried up there. And so I've got to do my due diligence to find out, hey, what does that mean to me as the future landowner? Do I have yeah. to grant access? Do I have to move the body? Do I have to? Uh, can I do I have to like a setback where I can build? how close to the grave I can build. So, yeah. there's just so have you seen stuff. Poltergeist? My <laughs> <laughs> hey, pet cemetery. Dog. Right. There's dogs up there. Yeah. 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 It's yeah a, no, I think corner of the land, but it, it is like, I knew exactly what it was before they told us. <laughs> but I think oh, this kind of goes to, so I'm going to play devil's advocate to something you said um, with, you know, if the land has been sitting there forever and there's nothing yeah. wrong with it, right, then there's probably something wrong with it. And mm -hmm. this is where I tend to be more optimistic, right? Um, I think there's a lot of land that is available and it has been sitting there. And I don't necessarily think it has to do with buildability as much as it has to do with people's Mm -hmm. I'm not going to use the right words here, ability to build on it, not because of the land, because of their resources yes. or to be yes. able to get, or the, the real lack of trades right yeah. now that will go two hours up in the mountains and build. Right. And so a lot of people sit around and say, well, it's totally buildable, but I can't get anyone up there to build, Yeah, you know, exactly. so it's just sitting there. It's Excellent. happening in Grand Lake right now. That's yeah. exactly what's happening. I mean, excellent point. Yeah, because, and that's part of what you have to, and that's once again, to tie this back to containers. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, maybe it's the building solution. Exactly. That, you know, they're looking at, they're saying, hey, yep. um, you know, we can't put a full foundation in here. Right. I can't right. put a house in it. Hey, I got a different idea. I got you. a solution for yeah, you. And yeah, that's, that's what Evan's, yeah. that's or, Evan's talking to that too. Yeah. yeah. Or if it doesn't fit, because once again, it gets back to the builders right. want to build a million dollar house. Well, yes. maybe the neighborhood I mean, doesn't that's... support a million dollar house. Right. That's right. right. And that would be the second point too. You get these exactly. lots and it's like, well, or what are you going to put up here? Well, it's going to be, I just want to build a cabin. And yeah. it's like, versus, well, I'm going to come up here and put a million dollar home. Well, that's way mm -hmm. overbuilt for the area. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. now, I know you are okay with it, but you know, are you going to pay cash for that? And yeah, are you going to get a that, loan? Well, that's a, you might run into some problems there. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so, yeah. And I think that's where, again, as long as you have a lending partner, like mm -hmm. let's say you for this example, where you can have these discussions um, and it just, I think you've heard all three of us for the listeners really hammer down on this you know your desire or your willingness to do something is 50 eh, percent of the battle right mm -hmm. the other 50 percent is your ability to can you 
Um, what do your partners want? Um, how is this going to work for your builder or your lender? And making sure that you do your due diligence. Make sure before you focus on the emotional part of, can you imagine, sweetie, living up there in our cabin? <laughs> it's like, hold a sec, that's, that's half of it. I'm glad you like it, you know, but you really got to make sure before you go down this path and you're putting up earnest money and you're tying, uh, tying land up and um, jumping ahead or skipping the line and saying, here's my cabin. Like, well, who's building that for you? Mm -hmm. Well, I haven't done that yet, but I've sketched it out on graph paper. It's like, <laughs> okay, hold on a minute. You know, yeah. you got to make sure whether it's your HOA or the county or you really have to make sure. And that's kind of why what led into the discussion, Troy, was, well, what's, what's first, the chicken or the egg, right? Do I need to do all of this before before I make an offer on the land or can I make an offer on the land and then do all of this? And when do I got to have my 20% down? You know, for the three of us, we know, um, mm -hmm. but for most people who have resources, money and the desire to do this, a lot of people don't know that they say, yeah. well, I don't, you know, uh, I don't want to tie up my 40 grand or 20 grand for, mm -hmm. you know, 90 days. And it's like, well, no, you'd have to pay that at closing. You know, and yeah. if you're doing that at closing, you know, you're good to go. Right. Yeah. Um, I think people just sometimes get lost in the timeline and mm -hmm. the checkpoints in the timeline. And I think that's where us as builders or developers or investors or lenders sometimes lose the, you know, the person who's just a manager at the big old tire store that happens yeah. to have good money or, the person who was gifted money from a passing or something, and they know they want to invest in it, but they have no idea how the process works. Yeah. And to the average listener, um, I hate to, you know, dampen it, but it's confusing as hell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's yeah. a lot of steps and there is a lot of stuff that you're going to have to say. The only thing I really bring to the table is my desire and my money. After that, <laughs> I got to let it all go because yeah. I'm not the expert here. And there's yeah. a lot of trust involved, but you're the one directing all of this. And mm -hmm. Shaden and I always talk about this. You're going to be the least knowledgeable in the room. Yeah. Right. Uh, yet somehow, weirdly, you're still kind of the boss, you know, <laughs> in all of yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. very strange for people. It's hard. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a great point. I Now, obviously, I'm financing. <laughs> so right, 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 uh, right. I always say, you know, if there's one A and one B, one A is always starts with the finance. Mm -hmm. Now, um, because you want to figure out, hey, what can I afford? You know, right. mm -hmm. yep. what do I have to clear up? Do I have to clear up my credit? Do I have to get rid of some of my debt? Do I have to work on my down payment? So um, as a lender, what I'm able to do is right away before you've done anything, before this just a twinkle in your eye, you said, hey, honey, you want to, what do you think about building the cabin? First thing, what can I afford? You know, right. um, you fill out an app, we we'll pull credit, we, we run everything and I come up with a budget. I say, hey, here's what you can afford. You can afford, you know, I mean, great news. I, I got you approved for $50,000. <laughs> <laughs> or it could be great news. I got you approved for four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But that's where you want to start. Mm -hmm. So from there, then you want to say, okay, then what do we need to do? Um, you know, if we allocate, you know, this much for land, then we've got this much for build, and then you can start working from from there um, to identify, you know, based on my budget, what type of build am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Right. Is this going to be a two thousand square foot cabin? Is this going to be a six hundred square foot cabin? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then so, but and then one B would be um, definitely is locating the area you're going to be in and understanding their guidelines, their building and zoning department. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the one thing I would say, you know, you want someone local because, you know, here in Denver, you know, if you got a problem or you got a question, Denver or Denver's not a good example. Let's say Lakewood. Mm -hmm. I can walk into the Lakewood office, <laughs> take yes. a number. I can sit and wait. And I can talk to somebody. Right. You know? Right. right. Um, Denver's not a good example. No, it's a horrible <laughs> example. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, you're like Denver, sorry, you're screwed. Uh, uh, Arvadas, you can do that. You know, there's mm. like three people working that desk. Right. They'll give you, nope, you can build that. Or no, you got to go talk to Bob yep, and, yep. Um, you, and buy you, him a beer. Buy him a beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So you got to be really good at, hey, I, I got to be persistent. I'm going to leave messages, may or may not get called back. You yeah. might just have to drive up there if it's, you know, a couple hours away. And yeah. one B, you know, doing this due diligence stuff is a lot of the times on the builder. 
So it, or, or your general contractor will do this work. I think that's also where sometimes the average consumer, the you know, the passive investor kind of thing gets hung up. It's like, okay, so 1A is getting finance. What can I afford? So I talked to Troy. Troy told me what I can afford. Now 1B is I got to go do all this due diligence. Well, you being the proverbial you, you don't have to go down and talk to Bob and buy him a beer. You can, but if your general contractor that is going to be doing the job will go talk to Bob, hopefully. Is that right? Un understanding yeah. that you're paying him to do that work. Understanding yeah. you're paying him to do that. And that's going to be a, a part of what you can afford. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right? yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, Shane, can yeah. you go down there and do that for me? Of course I can. <laughs> of course I can. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Here's my fee. Yeah. Here's my fee. <laughs> Um, and then, so I, okay. So maybe one A is what can I afford? One B is preparing for your due diligence. And are you doing that? And who is doing that for you? Yep. Right. And then once you find the right person or determine you can handle one B, then, then you go on to maybe the next step, which is actually evaluating, maybe actually saying, well, what are you building? Yeah. And where? Right. And maybe that's because I think a lot of people get into that, you know, and Shane and I have talked about this a thousand times, not on the podcast, just in general, you know, this whole idea of worth versus value, you know, and they're completely different. You know, that mm -hmm. car is worth it to me to spend yeah. that amount of money on that classic 1975 F 100 high boy truck. That was okay. I know you're, you're willing to spend 50,000 on it because mm -hmm. you've been looking for one for 10 years, but it's not valued at that, yeah. right? you know? And a lot of times people, when they hear, what can I afford? They say, well, I can afford that. No, you're willing to spend on that, but what mm. you can afford in terms of borrowing money is mm -hmm. not the same as what are you willing to spend, Yeah, you know? Yep. And I think that's also where people get hung up a little bit. It's like, I see it in the car business all the time. I'm willing to make an $800 car payment for this brand new Jeep. I understand that. Right? <laughs> I understand that you're willing to do that on your tooth and you're willing to maybe skip some mortgage payments to be able yeah. to cover it. Right. <laughs> but um, you can't I want to drive Uber it. at night. <laughs> right. I want to drive Uber at night. Exactly. <laughs> and it's like, that is your willingness to say it's worth it to me, but that's yeah. not what you can afford. And yep. what you can afford is not up to you. It's yes. up to the person you're asking to borrow money from. Yes, right? a very um, conservative yes, person yes, is going right. to tell you what they're willing yes, to Yes, a very conservative person <laughs> who's actually on the hook um, yes. for the money, especially giving out a bunch of money yep. and hoping that the construction project gets completed. Because mm -hmm. nothing is worse than, this goes back to having cash in your pocket, right? Nothing is worse, in my opinion, and Troy, I'm sure you, I, I think you would agree with this, is to loan out, let's say, $100,000 for the land, 50%, the first 100000 for the construction. The bank has given you $200,000 at this point. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you're paying interest only on it, and it's going to turn into a mortgage. But then something happens, the project doesn't get finished, and you default on the construction loan. And the bank says, okay, well, what do we have now? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, we have a hole. And, the yeah. ground, yeah. you know, and we have a foundation and now the bank is like we're not in the business of yeah. building you know, homes. not only trying to resell a home but to finish building yeah. one yeah. you yeah. know and it's yeah. so it's for the consumer to understand I, it's, I think it's just so critical for a consumer to understand what's happening yeah. you don't have all of that money saved up mm -hmm. you don't have three hundred thousand dollars so you're going to ask somebody and all they know of you is what's on a piece of paper. Yeah. Right? And they're and I still think sometimes I think about it. It's crazy. And mm -hmm. they're still going to be willing to just give you $300,000 in this yeah. example. I don't know you. I know your name. I see that you're working. You live here. You generally pay people back, but you know what? Screw it. Here's yeah. $300,000, you know, yeah. and it's still kind of crazy. And so what you can afford is not really up to you. Yep. It's, you may be willing to spend something, but you're not the one who's literally paying for it. Somebody else, a very yeah. conservative person, right. will tell yeah. you what you can afford. And I think it's a good thing for people to do because they run into this all the time where they say, that's crazy. I would spend, I could pay that. I'll go drive Uber. I'll go do this. And it's like, yeah, well, then go do that. 
and save up a bunch of money yeah. and then do it for, for two it. years. So we have a two year work history. And yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Anyways, I just wanted to give that context and kind of going through the timeline. And you said, you know, yeah. what you can afford. And, and, um, and I think you also bring up a really good point that it's actually good to have that perspective, that non-emotional, because it is emotional <laughs> when you're thinking about building oh, yeah. this cabin, you're thinking you're pitching the kids in the trees and, mm-hmm. you know, you sit on the porch on the fire. And, I mean, it's, it's very emotional and you get yeah. really attached to this. Yeah. And and um, and sometimes you just need that level head that kind of said, mm-hmm. hmm, let's kind of talk about this a little bit, yeah. um, because then there's also the reality. I just love the, the you start talking about the, the I hear this all the time. I've got the plan. It's all drawn up, Troy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My wife and I, we were talking over dinner last night. It's on the back of napkin. I'm just going to give that to the builder. Yeah. They're going right. to put this together. Um, yeah. Because or we don't worry thinking. what I can afford, Troy. The Airbnb <laughs> market's going to pay for it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, and but then the other piece too is you know that also uh, reconciling you what your plans are because um, they'll look at it. Uh, an engineer will look at an uh, architect. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 It's going to um, take know. more time to finish this though. <laughs> but it's good. Yeah. Your time and money. Uh, yeah. That's all. That's all it takes is more time and yeah. more money. You know, yeah. can you build this? Well, we can build a, a robot that goes to Mars and does <laughs> science. Yes. Yes, we can probably yeah. build it, but we don't need to know how much it costs. But let's talk about your three hundred thousand dollar budget. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. On your two thousand dollar a month income. Yes. Um, exactly. You know, yeah. We got to kind of have a discussion. This is really good. I yeah. I am so encouraged that people like you are out there mm-hmm. um, that are willing to have because half of this is just talking with banks and trying to get them to understand like i just want to have a conversation i know that you don't or you might not but half of it is just being open um on the you know talking about specifically with lenders just being open to the idea of this is a house Mm -hmm. or this is a solid structure in my backyard that is is just as good um, mm-hmm. It might be different, but what's really different is brick versus siding versus concrete versus all these uh, modular or prefab. There's so many differences already, and lending has traditionally adapted around it. So I'm still really encouraged that this will go in this direction, um, that there will be more options. Because I just think it's so, um, how do I want to say this? I just think it's so important on the lending side to create safe uh, responsible lending practices that opens up more opportunities for people to put themselves in a good position. Mm-hmm. They can put themselves in a good position. They put the lender in a good position and working together and having those conversations and evolving is critical. Uh, Cause you fast forward 50 years from now, I don't know how houses are going to be built and I don't know what we're going to be living in, but I'd hope that I'd have the ability to live in a home that's a little bit different than the one that I have now that could potentially burn down to the ground with the spark, right. you know, um, yeah. which is another benefit of container homes up in the cab, uh, up in the mountains. The mountains. Yeah. So, uh, which is one thing that we're looking at is evolving maybe a, I wouldn't want to call the niche, uh, lenders hate the word niche, um, <laughs> but a construction process that is making homes safer in high burn areas. Mm-hmm. And starting with a steel box is a good place to start, Yeah, yeah. you know? And, and it's like, I want to make sure that if we're successful, visions of grandeur, right? If we're successful in building a really solid, safe, burn-proof house or, or, or decreasing the risk up there, that lenders would help us do that because that is good not only for the lender, um, but for the consumer uh, to be able to go live in places. Um, I think it's only going to get worse. So that's yeah. kind of my low hanging fruit example is I want a lender to look at this and say, well, this is really good as houses are burning like crazy, like matchboxes yeah. boxes up in these mountains. And that's not good for us. We don't, we're not in the game of insurance. We're in the yeah. game of lending and making interest. Well, and you, you know, you bring up a really good point as well as like, you look at the future of building. I mean, mm-hmm. in Denver alone, we are in a housing crisis. I mean, mm-hmm. basically every city is. They anticipate, they, they think that Denver is down 60,000 houses for what the market needs. Yep. Crazy. And if yep. we continue to look at stick builds, 
we are going to continue to be 60,000 because it's, we'll it's just, just yeah, it's just going to snowball into and double it, it, you know, in 10 years. So we're yep. at 120,000 units. And that's, it's exactly why I personally have moved away from traditional construction. Yes. Um, yes. Right now you're forcing our hand away from it. That's fine. We need to adapt and move. Um, but at the same time, you better start letting us bring you alternatives yep. and not fight us continually on things that are actually better. You know, like Evan said it before, you go to a job site and you look around and go, how the fuck are we still doing it this way? This yeah. is insane. This yeah. is so stupid. And to not be able, it's so tunnel vision, this industry yeah. to move away from that. And people like you that are, are saying, guys, <laughs> this is actually better. It's better for you as the bank, as the investor, it's better for the end consumer. Let's all get together on this and mm -hmm. keep this train moving because there's yep. no reason not to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's good that you're here, man. I'm glad we had this conversation. It's, well, thanks. I really um, enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, I'm glad we could get you on. I'm, I'm glad that the you know everything fell the way that it did um, with some of our guests. So um, I really appreciate. It. I know it's yeah, and you know, for all the other lenders out there who might be listening to this as we mm -hmm. share it around. Don't you want a hundred people to be calling you? Right. <laughs> yes. Troy, you it's know, called some, more business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the demand or the inquiry or uh -huh. the curiosity is there. Right. And for those who are willing to, I don't even want to use the word creative, just honest to take a look at it. There is a huge opportunity there, I think, moving forward Yeah. Um, to diversify your portfolio and diversify your, your lending. Um, I, I just think it's, I think it's critical that there's more Troy's out there. So I'm super appreciative that we, uh, that you did this today, Troy. And I'm really happy that we found you right. um, through Colorado container homes. And I encourage people, I'm going to tell a couple people about you, Troy, that mm -hmm. actually I Me think um, are looking at certainly ADUs. And I have somebody else that's also looking at container construction of buying land um, so we'll um, we'll spread you around and and before we get off here, plug yourself a little bit. Tell yeah. tell make sure people know how to find you and get you. And we'll put all your links and stuff when we post this on all the platforms um, that we put our podcast on, which is pretty much all of them. We're even yeah. going to put this whole thing on YouTube as well. So we'll make sure that we put all that stuff there. But go ahead and give yourself a plug and tell people how they can find you. A absolutely, thank you. I mm -hmm. certainly appreciate the opportunity. I could talk about this for hours. I get yep. very passionate <laughs> about it. It's yeah. exciting. Good. Yeah. Um, so, and I think that that shows in the work that I do when I'm working with customers trying to build mm -hmm. these. Um, the easiest way to find me is that my website is uh, financemyadu.com. Um, I've got uh, some web pages. Or I've got a web page. I also have Finance My Container Home, but we're still working on that site. Um, we've got Facebook, Instagram, and, uh, you know, I'm, I work 24 7. So, you know, on the week, I get a lot of weekend calls, so if you want to call me on the weekend, uh, you want to text me on the weekend, I'll, I'll answer no matter what it, uh, what it is. Uh, I also look at my web pages as a resource, especially right now when you yep. go to finance my ADU. Um, I've got partner pages that hook up with the different builders that you okay. can consider. I've got some success stories you can take a look at, and I've also got some uh, direct links to some of the towns as far as their uh, zoning codes. Oh, perfect. Uh, any, awesome. Uh, regulations that they or guidance they would have for ADUs. Yep. Cool. And I cool. saw that on your website for five. I saw two two builders here mm -hmm. in Denver that you work with that do ADUs and stuff. So in that timeline of one A, one B, finding the right mm -hmm. people. Yep. Stop shop. Just, yep. You can just head there and Troy's got you covered, man. He's got you covered. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, Troy, you, man. Troy. I appreciate it. Uh, Thanks for having we'll me on, Definitely guys. be in touch. Um, yeah. It's been. Uh, it's been good to talk to you. I know uh, Evans has some conversations ahead of time. So I was looking forward to this for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll certainly, uh, we've got, we've got big plans too on some All of the right. stuff we're doing. So we're excited. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch with you yeah. soon. Yeah, Sounds yeah. good. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys Thanks for bye, everyone guys. out there. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button, whatever way you're consuming this. It's a huge support for us. It also lets you know when we put out new content, like with Troy. Right. Um, other than that, be safe, be kind, take care of one another. It's not as bad as we think it is. Just uh, focus on being happy and uh, see you on the next podcast. All right, guys. Appreciate it. All Have right, everybody. Bye take care, guys. See ya. Thanks, Troy. Thanks. Thanks.